afternoon and welcome to the 10th uh, CSEN supervisory discussion room. Uh, my name is uh, Ole and I am the director for macroeconomic and monetary policy management here at the CSEN Center. Today's uh, topic is um, the future of money and monetary policy in a digital world, although I should have probably called this, given the topics I'll talk about, I probably should have called this the future of money and central bank policy in a digital world, because we will touch upon a whole range of different issues uh, having to do with digital money and central banks. Let me just say a couple of items of housekeeping first. To begin with, this is, my, this is the first time I'm doing one of these discussion rooms, so please be kind uh, to me uh, if, uh, if, things, um, if things go wrong. The second thing I wanted to say is that um, it's a slightly different format than previous um, discussion rooms. Um, the, the, the title has supervisory in it. Um, this, this topic is more general. It's, it's, more, it's a broader topic. And um, this is because we are thinking about um, having different formats for discussion rooms, uh, uh, appealing to, to uh, different uh, parts of our member banks. So this is the first uh, more general, broader. I, OK. Increase the volume. Mm -hmm. I can do that. So, yeah, my phone. Yep, sorry about that. Um, we're trying to. Okay, I will. Uh, I will try to speak more loudly and uh, and into the mic. Or my technical assistant. So, is the problem with the mic? Okay. Yeah. And um, have you, um, have you, um, for those of you who have trouble uh, hearing me, um, do you have your speakers on, on, on full blast, so to speak? Anyway, um, so this is, uh, we may be starting a different, uh, different versions of these, these discussion rooms uh, in future. The next point I wanted to say is that I'll, my aim is to talk for about 30 minutes and leave 30 minutes for discussion and comments. Although I'm happy to, to um, I'm happy about questions and comments at any point uh, in between. Finally, um, I've sent out my uh, presentation beforehand, and uh, I hope you've had a chance to look at it. You can see that I have 56 slides, so I'm not going to talk about every slide in, uh, in those 30 minutes, which would not, not be fun. So the presentation is, by its nature, very broad brush. Now, I would be delighted and extremely happy to pick up particular topics in future discussion rooms. So um, I'll try to give a general overview today, and then we can return to some of these topics in future if there is, if there is interest. So the road plan for today, and now uh, I'll change to the presentation, is, oops, is as follows. I will give a sort of a quick uh, motivation uh, for today's presentation, a quick recap of uh, what money is and whether digital currencies are actually money in the classical sense. I'll talk about um, the big innovation that digital currencies bring to the table, although uh, Mark McKenzie spoke about the blockchain uh, in December. So um, if, you've, if you've been to that presentation, you will know what's coming. 
I will differentiate between two different types of, cent of different digital currencies, one having to do, one being privately issued and one being issued by the central bank. And then I will talk about different aspects of digital currencies, depending whether they're privately or central bank issued. And then at the end, I'll have some big open questions uh, that we can discuss either today or in future versions uh, of this. So let me tell you about the general, the, 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 the genesis of this presentation, which is that if you read the popular press in, uh, in, in Europe, in, in this particular uh, instance, there's an article in the Financial Times um, last year, which uh, has us believe that there are two big changes going on in our attitudes towards uh, money. One is that cash is dying out, and the second is that central banks will have to issue electronic money in the future. And indeed, some commentators say that these two developments are related, that cash is dying out because private individuals are using more and more digital money in return. Now, these two trends are not the same. So, to my mind, the phasing out of cash is not synonymous with the phasing in of state-backed state digital money. <coughs> now, I should also point out that my presentation lays no claim to originality. Um, a lot of it is based on work done uh, by my previous employer at the Bank of England. So if you know the Bank of England work, you know um, what's coming. And I've been involved in aspects of this uh, in, uh, in the past. The demise of cash, to me, is a real red herring. And there's very little evidence uh, for this. So I'm going to be very brief, extremely brief about this cashless future that is uh, said to be coming. So this chart shows uh, cash in circulation in a number of different countries. And if we look at the lines in red, which are see some member countries, there's no evidence of any decrease in cash in circulation for see some member countries. I note in passing that the two outliers at the bottom are Norway, which has remained flat, and Sweden, where cash use has actually, or cash and circulation has actually fallen. Sadly, Dr. Gendert can't be here with us today to tell us why this has happened. So there's no evidence for a big decrease of cash in, uh, in system member countries. So the report of the death of cash is, um, is an exaggeration. Now, you may or may not have noticed that there have been more than 600 digital currency schemes based on the distributed ledger that are either in development that have been introduced or existed for only a brief time. So this number took me uh, greatly by surprise that digital currencies are uh, a, a, a widely used uh, phenomenon. Now, what is a digital currency, or uh, some people call it a virtual currency? It's a digital representation of value. Okay, I've got some people talking in the background. Yeah. So, I can hear someone in the background, so I can the microphone uh, on mute. So, if you could ask everyone to put the microphone on mute, please. Thank you. Okay. So, what is a virtual or digital currency? It's a digital representation of value that is neither issued by a central bank, nor a public authority, nor attached to a fiat currency that is accepted by natural and legal persons as a means of exchange and can be transferred, stored, or traded electronically. Now, I talk about a digital currency. What's the big deal about a digital, digital currency? Let me start with the currency aspect first. 
And here I'm going back to the textbook in terms of what money is and what money represents. And there are three traditional values, sorry, three traditional functions of money, which is the store of value, unit of account, and the medium of exchange. These, um, these three roles, uh, or how far an asset serve these roles, can differ both from person to person and over time. So there may be changes occurring over time and even between different people. There's also an economic definition and then there's a legal or regulatory definition. At the moment, I would argue that digital currencies are primarily viewed as stores of value and nothing else. So they don't really serve as a medium of exchange or as a unit of account. Now, that being said, if you are aware of the Bitcoin uh, price uh, level, it's a digital currencies are a store of value, but with considerable volatility in the valuations. And I have more to, more to say about that in a second. The other aspect, the digital aspect, is also old hat, because most money is already digital. But the least interesting thing about the digital currencies is that they are digital, i.e. They, they only exist electronically. Um, uh, in fact, you know, most bank accounts, uh, bank accounts of banks at the central bank are already digital. The innovation comes from, as Mark said before Christmas, from how the, how the processes and the structure of the financial system will change over time. And if we think about payments, um, we have a, a very good example. When records were only kept in paper, it made perfect sense to keep a central rec record and aggregate transaction to reduce the administrative burdens. And when computers first arrived, the systems were digitized, but the processes were not fundamentally rethought in light of what the, this new technology of digitization could do. So digital, digital currencies are important for how they deploy the available technology in a new way. And in particular, as we heard before Christmas, the, this distributed ledger or the blockchain as it's known in, 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 in popular usage, the innovation is that the, the settlement technology allows transfers to be verifiably recorded without the need for a trusted third party. So there's no centralized entity that uh, for record keeping and for bookkeeping. Again, I'll talk more about this when we, when we discuss the technicalities of how a central bank would do this. So in terms of the innovation that comes from digital currencies, we can look at a few other innovations that, uh, that have been around. The first one being the so-called wrappers. Now, this is something like PayPal or Apple Pay or Google Wallet, which is a nicer use, user interface that, access, that accesses the existing payment systems and architecture. So it's not a new payment system and it's not a new currency. The second innovation is mobile money, the most prominent example being M-Pesa in uh, East Africa where money is stored electronically in a device, <coughs> excuse me, such as a chip card or on a hard drive in a personal computer. So this is um, not a new currency because it, it, it uses existing currency, but it uses a new payment system. We also have local currencies, so in some parts of Europe, regions or towns have introduced local currencies that are only valid in the in a particular region, district, or city to basically promote that particular region or city. Now, that's not a new payment system, but it is a new currency. It's, it's a 
distinctly, it's a distinct new physical uh, uh, manifestation. Where digital currencies come in is that they both offer a new payment system and a new currency. So the innovation occurs on both sides. So previously we had one or the other, in, uh, uh, an innovation happening on one or the other side, either a new payment system or a new currency, but a digital currency um, um, opens the door to innovation, both in terms of payment systems and new currencies. So in terms of what they bring to the table is that we are moving, we're changing the form of a currency and we're changing the type of current, the type of currency uh, as well. Now, as I mentioned before, I think we need to differentiate between privately issued digital currencies, which is what we have seen so far. And remember, more than 600 such currencies have existed, or um, are pl a total of more than 600 um, have been around and a state or a central bank issued digital currencies. Now, both of these can coexist, which uh, brings with it some interesting dynamics, which I'll talk about as well. So you can have both of these coexisting at the same time. So there, will be comp there can be competition. So how would a central bank issued digital currency coexist with private sector alternatives? Now, in general, um, what private digital currencies offer to users is an alternative unit of account. Many, many of them are governed by predetermined money supply rules. So there's a fixed amount of money that will be issued over the lifetime of the currency and a new payment system that is that, and the claim is that the new payment system is superior to that um, offered um, by existing banking systems. The assets of the digital currencies have some monetary characteristics, but as mentioned, they're not typically issued or connected to a seven currency. They're not, they do not represent a liability of any entity, and they are not backed by any authority. Remember that I said that digital currencies are mainly used as a store of value. Now, that's because they have zero intrinsic value, and they derive value only from the, from the belief that they might be exchanged for other goods or services, or they might be exchanged for sovereign currency at a later point. So there's a large element of speculation in this. Uh, in this besides the users who truly believe in a sort of cashless society and, uh, and a hard, uh, uh, and a hard um, a money supply target. Now, digital, digital currencies are transferred via this distributed ledger, which I said is the absolutely the genuinely innovative element within the currency schemes. Now, they're mainly issued by third-party institutions, um, almost exclusively non-banks. That seems to be slowly changing. So recently, um, I read that four of the largest banks in the world, uh, UBS from Switzerland, Deutsche Bank from Germany, Santander from Spain, and Bank of New York Mellon from the US, have combined to develop a new form of digital cash that they believe will become an industry standard in clearing and settlement. Again, it's only to be used for that purpose and not in kind of general use, but slowly commercial banks are getting in on digital currencies as well. Now, what are the benefits of digital, digital currencies? One is a reduction of transaction costs. So at the moment, the transaction costs are below 0.05% compared to some 
two or three percent for credit cards and so on and so forth. So they have very low transaction costs. They have faster transaction speed, so the transaction processing time is uh, uh, a lower. And there's a certainty of payments received, so the blockchain ensures a much higher uh, um, certainty of payment than other payment systems. And then there's, a, there's the argument that there's a high divisibility of digital currency units, so you can pick if you wanted 0.68135 of a, of, of a Bitcoin, you could, if you, if, if you so wanted to. The final argument is that uh, it's uh, a way of, um, uh, of uh, allowing for greater financial inclusion uh, as well. Uh, the fact that um, everything is digital and therefore more accessible to the public at large. I don't want to talk about the transaction costs right now. We can talk about them later or at a, a future point. The transaction costs are low because there's an implicit subsidy. So these transaction costs are, can be expected to rise in the future. Um, um, and that may hinder the, the development of digital currencies uh, as well. There are also risks of privately issued digital currencies. And uh, the European Banking Authority issued a report two years ago, sorry, three years ago now. And um, if you are in possession of the presentation, these are live links. So these are live hyperlinks. So just click on the link and it will take you straight to the document. The EBA identified approximately 70 risks uh, arising from private digital currencies under five headings. So there are risks to users, other market participants, financial integrity, payment systems, and regulators. I'm not going to talk uh, about uh, any of them, or, or indeed all of them, right now. I'll direct you to, to the document if, if you are interested. And, and, and I have a summary here of some of the, the broader headings. Um, in fact, what um, I would like to talk about is the relationship between private digital currencies and central banks. And there are a number of topics that uh, we should be aware of um, as uh, central banks in terms of our interaction um, with, uh, with digital currencies in the future. Now, I mention this because, um, again, anecdotal evidence seems to suggest that there are a number of central banks that are at least actively contemplating um, the topic of digital, 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 digital or virtual currencies. And the names that uh, are being uh, mentioned include the Central Bank of Russia, China, the Federal Reserve has started um, issuing uh, papers uh, looking at um, at, uh, at least um, the, the distributed ledger. Uh, I know the, the Banco Central Filipinas is looking at the issue, as is the Bank of Canada and the Bank of England. So it's slowly becoming a topic that's more widely looked at in central bank circles. In terms of private digital currencies, I think there are at least five topics that uh, we could look at in, in more detail, having to do with the payment system, the supervisory responsibilities, with the conduct of monetary policy, uh, the issuance of physical currency, and financial stability. So for example, in terms of the risks to payment system stability, what so some digital currencies uh, based on the distributed ledger aim to create a network that would work in isolation from or only with a marginal connection to existing payment systems. Others, on the other hand, um, could be used 
Uh, at this point, on the other hand, use the traditional payment systems uh, offered by banks, for example. So the interact the, the existence of two competing payment systems uh, might might have consequences for the payment system stability as a whole. All of these points I'm going to mention depend on how widely a private digital currency is going to be used. At the moment, the digital currency is not of great importance, and the sort of the, the, the the, the, the amount of currency being traded is not all that large. So in a certain sense, the digital currency systems are not of a critical nature. But this may change going forward if public acceptance and public usage of digital currencies increases. In addition, we may want to think about the risks to financial market infrastructure in the sense that the distributed ledger changes um, the basic setup of aggregation and netting. And I'll talk more about uh, what, what, the act, what the effect is on collateral and so on uh, a bit later on. Um, so there may be an impact uh, upon um, financial market infrastructure in the sense that there is the, an emergence of financial services outside of the existing regulatory perimeter. There may be risks to financial intermediaries in the sense that the distributed ledger upends the traditional role of actors in the financial system, particularly the banks, in terms of the roles of banks in terms of monitoring the behavior of depositors and the liquidity and maturity transformation. There is the potential risk to monetary policy in the sense that if a subset of people transact exclusively in a digital currency, then the central bank's ability to influence demand for this group may potentially be impaired. Again, this depends on the extent of substitution between the digital currency and the fiat currency. There may be risk to price stability in terms of the effects on the quantity of money, the velocity of money, the use of cash, uh, and so on. Again, these risks depend on the quantity of digital currency and its usage. And finally, the risks to financial stability, which arise from um, the interaction between the digital currency and the banking, uh, the banking system. I have already talked about the volatility of a digital, digital currency, so there may be connections um, in terms of an asset price crash among a free floating digital, digital, digital currency and financial stability if this digital currency is very widely traded. You can see that I'm, uh, in the interest of time, I'm being very broad brush about talking any of, uh, any of these topics. Let me go to what I think is, in fact, the most interesting aspects from our point of view, which is the topic of digital currencies and central banks, i.e., to what extent will we have to respond to digital currencies by issuing our own digital currency, i.e., disrupting the disruptors. If you can't beat them, join them. If there's competition from the private sector, why don't we as central banks get in on the act? And indeed, um, some central bankers, Andy Haldane, for uh, chief economist of the Bank of England, for example, and uh, Ovi Quickstep from the from Novus Bank, have already commented on the fact that it's technically possible to for an existing central bank to issue digital only liabilities in a distributed ledger payment um, at the moment. 
Now, one thing I should mention is that a lot of this depends not on us as the central bank, but on the public at large. Decides or will only be as widely used as the public decides it wants to use um, uh, the central bank um, digital currency. Although, as I talk about in a minute, we have certain advantages over privately uh, issued digital currencies. I should also point out that the distributed ledger is not strictly necessary for a central bank issued digital currency. There's nothing that prevents us from already now offering accounts to private individuals at the central bank, just as we would do for commercial banks. So that would be a digital currency, a central bank digital currency, without a distributed ledger. In addition, there are different forms that a central bank issued currency could take. So it could be something akin to mobile money or e-money, i.e. Can, it can only be used for retail transfers and doesn't receive any interest. It can be an actual bank account where we offer the possibility of the public to bank with us. Or it could be a full displacement of paper currency. And indeed, there have recently been some high profile calls for the abolition of cash. Ken Rogoff being uh, probably one of the most prominent advocates of abolishing cash altogether. So a full displacement for paper currency would mean the abolition of cash and the, and the introduction of an electro electronic alternative. Um, in all of this, we have to um, keep an eye on what the effects are on uh, commercial bank deposits, i.e. the other main form of cash existing in the economy. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So depending on the extent of currency, comp uh, currency competition, and this is what this chart is meant to show. So we have on the top, uh, on the top axis, we have um, the degree or the extent to who's allowed to bank with us, to have a digital account with us. Is it only M the non-bank financial institutions? Is it all firms or is it everyone in the economy is allowed to have an account with a central bank? And what is the extent of the, uh, 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 of the services that the central bank will offer? Is it only e-cash or is it a full service account? And a lot of it depends on the extent of participation and the degree of substitution. So you can see that um, this is from a speech by the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England. Uh, the light blue to the dark blue, there's a, a gradation uh, depending on where we are in this particular diagram. So how would this currency work in, in practice where we would let ind individuals and firms open accounts at the central bank? The central bank would keep a, the, the distributed ledger i.e. would be tightly controlled by the central bank. And the central bank account, according to most plans, would be guaranteed in full by the state. So there would not be a limit as it is right now in terms of, of a deposit insurance scheme. Now, the in terms of how this could be implemented, there are two different approaches a direct approach and an indirect approach. I'll be very brief about this. 
in a direct approach, the central bank would become a bank all by itself. So we would provide customer services, we would provide payment cards, we would provide internet banking, apps, and so on and so forth. So the account holders would interact directly with us um, and uh, just as they would with the existing bank at the moment. I think no central bank has the manpower and the ability to offer these services to all individuals and firms in the economy. And in addition to which, I don't think any central bank would like to get involved as this, as hands-on as this approach would have it. So I think the most likely approach would be an indirect access where there are intermediaries, these digital cash account providers that would do all the services for us. And access to our, to the account would be through these account providers. <clears throat> now, what are the economic effects of a central bank digital, digital currencies? Well, they depend on how the, the currency is designed and um, on the extent of currency substitution. Remember these, this gradation from light blue to dark blue. So, what the central bank digital currency did was to substitute for cash. I would reckon that most people would probably still keep their money in the commercial banks. But the more closely a central bank digital currency resembled a genuine bank account with all services, the more money would flow out of existing bank deposits and into the central bank. This is a good thing or a bad thing. And here opinions uh, differ. On the one hand, this might make commercial banks safer because um, uh, the, the amount of uh, uh, the, the shifting from cash from a commercial bank to the central bank improves liquidity and, um, and, and the, the, the sort of the positions of the bank. On the other hand, taking deposits away from banks could make the supply of loans more variable. And in return, banks would become more reliant on wholesale markets for funding. So there may be two things going on here. The good news is that if we allowed individuals, private sector companies, and non-bank financial institutions to settle directly in central bank money, this would reduce the concentration and liquidity and credit risk to payment systems. So this would reduce, but not eliminate, the systemic importance of large banks. So we would eliminate a source of moral hazard from the financial system. In addition, it would widen the options for monetary policy. You can see that this comes from research done by central banks in industrialized countries where uh, which, that think a lot about negative nominal interest rates and helicopter money. Both of these unconventional monetary policies become much easier to do with a state-backed digital currency. That being said, it would also allow the state to make inroads in terms of money laundering, corruption, tax avoidance, and uh, and other issues, which I'm not going to, not going to talk about. Um, a central bank-issued digital currency might also reduce counterparty risk in the payment systems. At the moment, a tiered system where entities lower down have to post collateral with a central counterparty requires the posting of collateral. The central bank system would allow settlement directly between payee and payer, so counterparty risk is avoided, 
so there's no posting of collateral. So there's a, a much higher availability of high quality collateral that at the moment goes into that is just simply used for collateral purposes and not for other purposes. It's also thought that a central bank digital currency would represent a partial removal of too big to fail concerns um, because the, the central bank currency or the central bank issued a um, digital currency would, um, would mean that there's a, a, a separate a uh, universally accessible and large payment system alongside an existing bank-based system. So any the hypothetical failure of any individual bank therefore need not necessarily cause the same ripples um, that it does at the moment. Um, I should also point out that um, that there are efficiency aspects to this and uh, also um, a competition aspect uh, if the um, if you find that the banking system at the moment is highly concentrated a central bank issued digital currency might offer one way of uh, providing competition to central banks. All of this, of course, is predicated on the system working perfectly, and a and my main worry in all of this is that a successful cyber attack on a central bank implementing a centralized distributed ledger could be catastrophic. If all you have is a digital account of your money um, and no paper ledger, uh, if you wake up and your account is gone, um, that what are the backups that, that are available for all of this? I've spoken for, sorry, was a question? I've, I've spoken for um, long enough, let me, uh, much, much longer than, than, than I wanted to, so let me offer some conclusions and leave you with some, um, some, some big open questions. In terms of, this, of how central banks are going to uh, to do this, do we need the distributed ledger or not? Uh, do we need this, this, the distributed ledger to reap all the benefits of a digital currency or not? And, uh, a number of central you see some member uh, banks or member economies are still money supply targeters. Might there be an effect on the money supply? How do we want the distributed ledger to work? Do we want it to be private, i.e. maintained by the central bank, or public, i.e. do we allow them to, to have copies of the blockchain as well? And a key attraction of digital currencies is, is the transaction fees. These will grow as time goes on. So are we, worried, are we worrying about something that in a couple of years' time may no longer pose a, com a competitive threat that it is at the moment? Do we, does there have to be a fixed final supply um, as most digital currencies do at the moment? Is this an advantage or disadvantage? Do we allow non-residents to have accounts with the central bank? Does this have implications for capital flows uh, and in extremis um, the exchange rate if we allow non-residents uh, access to the central bank's distributed ledger? And finally, should a central bank distributed currency be remunerated um, or not? So there are these and other open questions um, which I'd like to leave you with. Um, I hope this presentation was uh, interesting and raised some interesting points. I have references in the back. They're available with hyperlinks to take you there. And um, I'm happy 
uh, for us to have a discussion or comments um, in, the, in the remaining time. 